Hello and welcome to another Pilates Hour. And we've got an exciting topic today, at least exciting for me. Yeah, so today we are continuing sort of our introduction to the new book that's out. So the new book, Principles of Movement. Um, hopefully you have looked into that and we'd love to hear your feedback on the book. Um, a lot of years in the making of it. And today we are going to be diving into the next principle, which is the principle of dynamic alignment. Here we're looking at the body. And a lot of times we get, and again, this is sort of a continuation of my discussion with um, Eric Franklin last week, which we had a wonderful webinar with him. If you missed it, please look to find the, the recording of it. Uh, but really looking at how do we, you know, how do we consider dynamic alignment of everything, right? We're looking at our body, our mind, our spirit, and how does that relate to us as Pilates teachers and physical therapists? We have to learn all these bony landmarks and anatomy to be able to teach movement. And it's like, yes, yes, we do. We don't have to teach movement from, say, a volitional muscle contraction, but we do have to understand the relationships uh, the human body and what they and how they relate to each other, how they should. We can also see it in the standing posture that again, that idea of the bi curved spine that is such a powerful concept for us. So when we think of movement, it doesn't matter if we are doing a swan, if we're doing a squat or a bridge or a rollover or a roll up or doing rotation. What is the relationship between the head, the thorax, and the pelvis? So here we have what we call our goalpost. And goalpost, we're basically looking at the ability to maintain that axial elongation with what we call perturbing levers, or the, the challenge is bringing the arms up into 90-90 and then taking them up towards the ceiling in a V. So here we're looking at rotation in seated. I love this test because it gives us so much information if they have that thoracic mobility or do they push it all down in their low back or were they always relying on their hips and their ankles in their rotation. So as we look at these videos, does Shelly maintain that axial alignment or does she compensate by going into a hyperlordosis or kyphosis in the thoracic spine, right? So these again, looking functional, if she compensates by going into flexion or extension, she'll lose some of that axial rotation. I find this incredibly interesting. There was a great study that came out not too long ago where they were interviewing people and they were changing their postures. And it was there was a direct correlation of negativity in their answers that came with those that had a slouch posture compared to those that stood up tall in their positivity. So very interesting that we could literally change the perception of the world and what's being asked of us merely by changing that axial alignment or in our posture. I always find that to be incredibly interesting. And that, here we're looking joints of the extremity and the first two that sort of come up the upper and lower extremity is the ball and socket joints of the shoulder and of the hip. And these are very, you know, very cool joints to talk about. And they have a lot of similarities and they have some differences. When we look at the similarities, they're both ball and socket joints. And they basically have a cup, they have a round ball that sits in that cup and it moves around and has motion in all planes of movement. So when we talk about a ball and socket joint, we're often talking about the idea of having uh, the movement and flexion extension, side bending, abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation, and circumduction. So both of these joints have all those capacities of movement. So here we're looking at the elbow and wrist and the knee joint and the ankle. Now these joints, they get, you know, the further away we get from the ball and socket joint, you might think that they're simpler joints, but they're actually more complex. And the reason why I say that is because the elbow is a pure hinge joint right? It's really a hinge joint. It doesn't have any rotation between the ulna and the humerus, uh, where the knee is a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a second. But that pure hinge joint means that the radius must rotate around the ulna, 
and the radius is the primary weight bearing into the wrist and to the hand. So this creates some interesting alignment issues when we look at things like closed chain activities of the upper extremity, like a push-up, right? Or doing swan or anything in prone or on the Pilates reformer or the bar. Anytime our hands are fixed on a permanent surface, we have to think of this relationship that in order to have some kind of alignment, a couple things have to happen. Um, let's jump down into the knee. Now, when we get down into the knee, uh, the knee is is probably one of my favorite joints mechanically. So when we look at the knee uh, below, you see what's called a bicondylar joint. This is a little different than the elbow. They might look a little bit alike, but they're different. And the bicondylar joint is, again, these are weight-bearing joints in the lower extremity. And there is uh, a spin and a glide and a roll that happens between the femur condyles and the tibia. So it has a little bit of looseness, and it has about 15 degrees of rotation available to it, unlike the elbow that does not. The rotation in the arm only comes from the shoulder, which has the rotation mobility, and also from the forearm of the radius rotating over the ulna. In the lower extremity, it really takes place inside the joint between the, the femur condyle and the tibial plateau. Now, when we look at that fibula, the fibula, again, is a stabilizing force for the ankle. And unlike the wrist that is very open chain, that ankle has the malleoli that come around and wrap that talus. And the wrapping of that talus is for stability. And again, looking for congruency. So, so here's a good example of, uh, we're looking at alignment of the lower extremity. This is a loss of alignment of the lower extremity. It's one of the most common ones. Um, you're either gonna collapse medially or you're gonna collapse laterally uh, through that knee. The knee is what we see. We might also see the foot or see some pronation or eversion happening in the ankle. But where we typically see things functionally with humans and bipedal activity, so thinking of things like the marriage proposal lunge or thinking of footwork on the reformer or thinking of single leg press on the chair, we're looking at these relationships. And we, we, we've been taught that we look at the hip, the knee, the ankle, the second toe. So what is happening when somebody really loses this range of motion? So now we go into upper extremity and we're looking at this relationship. Now, remember I said that the elbow itself, so if we look, this is actually the cubital of the elbow, but you notice the hand is facing this way. So when I go into a push-up position, I often like the cubital to be able to look at each other. So the hollowing of the elbows looking at each other, that means that my shoulders have to be a little bit internal rotated, right? The humerus has to be a little internal rotated. When we look at human gait, um, you know, we have this very dynamic nature of our feet. So I love studying gait. When we heel strike, so on the far left of your screen, well, the foot is going to be in supination, right? And you're getting ready to load the leg, which is going to be like a flexion. So that means that the tibia is getting ready to internally rotate as the femur is getting ready to externally rotate on load, which is going to be in this mid stance. And that, that, the body, and it can also be the other way in effect change in the body in the mind relationship, which is where I find our greatest strength as Pilates teachers. We create these positive movement experiences for our clients. They have increased awareness and consciousness of their body. That leads to increased consciousness and awareness of themselves in space and in their communities and how they impact others. So I do really strongly believe every one of these principles not only apply to the structure of the body, but also apply to the mind and the spirit. Above all things, we want you to have a wonderful weekend and most importantly, to be kind. And we'll see you on the next Pilates Hour. Thank you for watching. Click here to watch more.